Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rangers Review Morning Briefing. It is Wednesday, the 10th of July. I'm Derek Clark, and I'm joined by uh, Joshua Barry. First of all, how's it going, Joshua? Good, Derek. Uh, not as good as Chris, who's soaking up the, the atmosphere before the Netherlands versus England. But, um, yes, yeah, more, more Rangers events to discuss today. Sadly, not on the picture or signing news. Yep, uh, Chris joins us as well over in Holland, uh, where excitement is building ahead of uh, the big one this evening. Uh, Chris tells us uh, they're already on uh, the beers already, Chris. They were. Uh, myself and my uh, press pack colleagues were having a, a croissant and a coffee this morning, and uh, the barmaid was pouring the first uh, first lagers. Uh, shamefully, from a, a Scottish press per, uh, point of view, the lagers were not for us. But we've got a uh, we've got a busy day ahead of us, so uh, that will have to that will have to wait. But uh, no, the, the Dutch fans outside the window behind us are uh, already getting in there, and they've got the battle fever on. Safe to say. <laughs> Yeah, looking forward to it. If it's anything like last uh, night semi, then uh, we could be in for uh, quite a game uh, tonight. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure it'll be very lively over there this evening. Uh, before we talk all things Rangers, though, just a quick word for our podcast sponsors, uh, MPH Boilers. Uh, if you want uh, an award-winning family-run business uh, serving all of mainland Scotland, specialising in top quality boiler installations and servicing, then these are the guys to go to. So do go and check them out, folks, if uh, your boiler is uh, on the link. Right, lots to talk about. Um, where should we start? Uh, let's start with uh, a bit of commotion yesterday with uh, the minutes from the fan advisory board being released by the club. Uh, now, before we get into uh, the stadium situation and other bits and pieces, uh, another thing I think was important to note was uh, Niels Coppin was in attendance uh, at said event and uh, he noted some uh, interesting uh, points his vision, uh, of course, for uh, Rangers going forward. He presented slides uh, to the board, uh, giving an insight into the strategy process and general philosophy for recruiting players. Uh, and it highlights some key points. I'll just run through them, then I'll come to your good self, Joshua. It's a uh, strong and efficient process with the manager involved. Data and video as a big part of the recruitment process. Balanced squad to age positions, nationalities, personalities and value. A dynamic squad to be successful domestically and in Europe. We prioritise high technical quality and athleticism. Players need to uh, be robust, reliable and focused. Determine key markets where we can be successful. More active in untapped markets. I for Scottish market and talents. Retain our best academy talents. Use our platform more to give opportunities to young players and develop them. Buy at the right price, sell at the right moment, recruit players with the ability to make a next step to a big five league, stronger contract management, and the club demands winners, uh, robust players uh, that can cope with high amounts of games and intensity of the Scottish game. Uh, the club demands winners. Need loads of them, Joshua. Yeah, I mean, it's a list, Eric, that I think Rangers should have had play in, in place before they appointed Niels Kopp, and every big club should have a recruitment strategy. The difficulty that Rangers have had, and one of the reasons we're in this this summer where there is so much disquiet and, and, and unrest and the fan advisory board issue, Derek, that you referenced there, it's just another example of uh, w when it rains, it pours, and, and one thing after another, when Rangers really need to try and change the mood going into this new season, which is going to be difficult regardless. The difficulty that they have had and the, the reason that they've now pivoted to, to a model like the one that we, we spoke about it before, what Coppin is trying to, to do at Ibrox and how things are starting to change recruitment-wise. They've had different recruitment policies over the last number of years, different people heading it up, no real figure of continuity. So what you're what you're referencing there, and we discussed yesterday, didn't we, that Coppin and Co are having to squeeze a lot of work into one window when ideally you wouldn't be rebuilding a squad or, or putting a squad through a new stage in one transfer window. The difficulty that, that, that you've got is that there has been a very, very different approach last summer where it was a manager-led approach. We've discussed many times before that Michael Beale press conference where he, he, he said the line that you'll be able to trace all these players back to me when you've you've jolted so dramatically from that transfer uh, model last summer and, and, and similar ones in summers before to what you've had now, there is, is going to be growing pains. I don't think there is much, and again, you can only base it on the evidence of what you see 
the noises that we hear and we report. I, do, I don't think there is much of an argument that the, the model that Coppin is trying to introduce and the one that Rangers have bought into from the, the everything from, from the, the transfer board that we've discussed as well, that looks in principle to be a good policy. The question is, how long will it take to, to bed in? How much are, are Rangers up against in terms of squad building capacity? Because obviously they've just lost another five players in the, the most recent uh, co contract expiry because of, of the way that the squad has been managed. They're, they're up against all these different things. You've seen with the profile of player that have come into the club already, there that I think there is exciting players in there. The noises you hear are exciting. Again, the difficulty is because uh, Coppin comes into a backdrop of so many different plans, so many different people leading transfers, no real continuity between squads, between playing styles over a number of years that you get this summer where so much work needs to be done. And obviously it's difficult to, to do that amount of work in one summer successfully. Yep, some interesting points uh, in uh, that uh, vision there, Chris. I guess a lot of them are, are sort of... Uh, you would expect a club like Rangers, but he's obviously identifying we need uh, more robust players uh, and buying at the right price, selling at the right moment is an important factor as well. And uh, so often Rangers, uh, well, we've seen this summer, of course, uh, a number of players heading out the door under freedom of contract. But it's uh, these key factors that, that need addressed, don't they, if Rangers are wanting to be successful? And I think, as, as Josh outlined there, they are, they are factors that should have been addressed a long time ago. It's the I think everyone would agree with the points. You know, if it's in these meetings, or it's in these notes. Sorry, I think all those bullet points you read out, Derek. I think the fans would appreciate them. They would uh, they would all agree with them. But it's like, well, why hasn't that been done previously? And Neil Scobin is not the first person to hold to hold that uh, position. Philippe Clement is not the first manager to, uh, to hold that position, so you have to ask. I think the, these points are, are valid and they're good, but they also raise questions of what's been done before, what has been allowed to happen before, to, as Josh said, get Rangers in the situation, another five players walking out the door for free at the end of this, at the end of a contract, going into another summer needing a rebuild, a million spent on the squad last summer and the window before that and the window before that for very little uh, return in terms of the in terms of silverware. So I think it, it was encouraging to see that Neil Scoppin has has he's, he's also come in. He's had a time to uh, to assess the club and assess various aspects of the football department. If he's good on his word, if he can put um, processes and people in place to tick all of these boxes, Rangers should be in a in a better place. Uh, now you have to give Neil the the time to to come in and actually put his uh, put his vision across. He's also presented that to the board to get in the club in the first place. Been in the club for a long time now. Um, we now need to start seeing the, the outcomes here. It's fine saying here's here's what's wrong. Ultimately, it's how do you how do you fix it? Where will Rangers be? And at the end of the transfer window, where will Rangers be at the halfway point of the season? Ultimately, where will Rangers be at the end of the season? And what's um, what's the silver we're going to be like? Because that's all that the fans are really interested in. So yes, it's important. Yes, you can be encouraged. Um, and I think any, any time I've spoken to Niels, I've been impressed with him. I think he does come across well. I think he he is the right man for that for that position. We've written a lot about him more on, on the site over the last few months, certainly after he was appointed. We've written a lot, we've seen a lot, we've heard a wee bit. Now we have to see what he can actually go and put in place. Yeah, Derek, can I just, you yeah, see that at this point here, sorry, that this point here from John, it says, you know, most most people could highlight that, that point. That, that's true. And, you know, if you, if you sit in most board meetings, clubs need to have recruitment strategies. Um, it's finding the players and shipping out the old guard. I think this is the really difficult point of this summer is when you have a lot of players and, and, and a lot of experienced players who have long-term contracts. Uh, Coppin, um, uh, let's say Coppin and Clermont, they're not inheriting a clean slate. And I think that's the, that is what is going to, as Chris rightly says there, that is what is going to be, I, I guess, the real one of the real signposts of whether this has been a successful summer or not because we hear so much about the importance of structure behind the behind closed doors at clubs uh, above managerial level we've seen how many managers have come in and out uh, of rangers in the last four years again i think just the most important point to reiterate is think how many playing styles different visions different manager visions have been bought into in the last four years how you fluctuated from a sporting director and now to a football board with with a head of recruitment whatever model rangers are now settled on again which, which seems sensible which seems to have legs legs to it it needs to be given time to to be implemented but the difficulty is because of the mistakes that have been made in the last few summers that that issue of shipping out the old guard getting players who are on longer term contracts 
to, to other clubs, that's a really, really difficult thing as well. And an underrated difficulty of the transfer window. And, and, and that is something that Coppin inherits because of mistakes before, but it's going to be just as important as getting players in, not least because it obviously helps finance the, finance the incomings. Yep. A uh, lot of consternation as well in, uh, sorry, in that uh, advisory board on the stadium upgrades. Uh, and, and it, it says the club shared... Uh, that the director of operations and venues working with the facilities team and the main contractor elements of the project are out with uh, our control and we are working to make sure we have contingencies in place. Everything is going according to plan at the minute. Now, it caused a, a bit of uh, consternation, as I said, on social media yesterday, Chris, uh, fancy, because it was, I think, three days later the uh, it was announced, I think, that uh, there was going to be uh, a delay. So uh, you can understand fans' uh, frustrations with regards to that heading along, being told it's uh, going to plan. Uh, and then uh, a few days later, it isn't going to plan. I think that was one of the the headline points, if not the headline point, to come out of those uh, minutes that uh, released yesterday. And I think as we spoke about on the show uh, yesterday morning, I think it was the Rangers fans deserve full clarity openness, honesty on timelines, on financial ramifications, on every aspect of this of this deal. The Rangers fans deserve to know the full story. Um, it's it's not it's not right that they are being kept in it. Now of course the club can't they, they might not want to give a running commentary on everything. They won't want to uh, give a, a a blow by blow account of discussions with SRU or the SFA or UEFA or uh, or other uh, uh, stakeholders in this. But I think it's 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 only fitting right that the Rangers fans are given more insight into one how how they got here, but more importantly how the board are going to get them out of this situation. Mm. Um, and I think those uh, those um, FAB minutes didn't you know knowing what was going to come down the line, knowing how the how the process had had unfolded, knowing what they knew at that stage. Um, it doesn't it's, it's not a good look to then go into that meeting, put out. Uh, knowing that that was going to come out afterwards, obviously, I don't think yeah. it's, I, I don't think it's a good look for the if the the board and, and for the club to present the, the the facts and the timeline in that way. Um, but then, obviously, we, history then paints a very different a very different picture. So I think that's one I think that's one lesson that the club have to have to learn from this. As as we said the other day, as Steve said last week, there was a piece from David Edgar on the on the uh, yeah. review website this morning. Uh, the Rangers fans just deserve. Full I say, openness, honesty, transparency. If it's bad, tell them it's bad. Treat them like adults. Don't treat them like customers. Yeah, you can check that piece out in the description below, folks. Um, well, we're going to let you go shortly, Chris. Um, so just before you do that, there's a great uh, interview on the website as well with uh, Ross McCausland. Uh, what can people expect when they read that? Uh, a great interview, as you said, because obviously it was myself that was involved in it, and it's myself that wrote it. So uh, usual, uh, usual standards, new season, same old quality of content. Um, <laughs> no, it was, it was uh, good to catch up with us that day. There, um, he spoke a lot about his, obviously his first season in, as a as a first team player. Um, I think around about October, November time, we had the piece on the site like, uh, charting his his Rangers rise. Spoke to a couple of people uh, that worked with him in his, his formative years, and basically told the story of how this time last summer. He went back to Northern Ireland and he went through his own pre-season back on the training pitches where he first fell in love with the game back in his local community. Fast forward 12 months, he's then back at his dad's RSC um, doing a Q&A as a Rangers first team player, has Champions League to look forward to, he's got a League Cup medal. I don't think it was a it was a, an outstanding season for him. I think there, there were moments there where he will be disappointed, certainly collectively in terms of Scottish Cup and also the league. But I think overall he was one of the like positives that he can take out of the campaign. Really interesting to see how he can uh, kick on during this season, and he mentions that himself in, in that piece. He is he's going to be judged differently. He's no longer going to be Ross McCausland, youngster coming into the Rangers first team. If he wants to be an established Rangers player, he has to step it up. He has to be as has to be as strong as possible. Um, I think that's definitely a, I think that's definitely something that he can he can learn from last season. He has to take that forward into into this season as well. So no, good to good to catch up with him. The first uh, the first interview of the of the pre-season tour um and plenty more to come over the next over the next couple of days. Yeah I was going to ask that before you head off what does your, your day look like today? 
uh, going to go and mingle with some of the locals, uh, go and soak up a bit of the big match atmosphere. I won't be able to get a, won't be able to get a beer uh, right right now. Unfortunately, there is uh, work to be done later on. But um, no, there's a Rangers are playing a, a bounce game this afternoon, um, so I'm going to hopefully get up and see that, and we'll do some uh, do some coverage on on the site later on. And I think I'll be catching up with Josh for another video uh, out out and about uh, later on. So uh, no, I'll keep you keep your eyes peeled on the on the YouTube channel and keep an eye, eye out on on the site and all our uh, social medias later on. Um, and we'll have uh, full coverage of the, of the day. Uh, I saw comments I was coming in asking about plans for this, the trip, uh, media, uh, more media access tomorrow. So hopefully hearing from uh, the manager and a couple of players tomorrow. Um, safe to say the manager has a number of points that has to have to be addressed over the over the course of the trip. So uh, hopefully we can get a proper a proper sit down, a proper catch up with him. So uh, now plenty of coverage from the manager, players, and also uh, ticking all the all the boxes in terms of games to come as well. So uh, now plenty to look forward to and. Uh, We'll see how we'll see how the day goes in, in terms of mingling with the locals. Yeah, good stuff, right? Well, we'll let we'll let you go, Chris. Uh, you're a busy man today, so uh, thanks for uh, coming on uh, the show as ever. Um, so there, there he's uh, heading off, uh, but unfortunately not going to the bar as no. uh, many Dutch people are getting ready for tonight. Just before we go back to Rangers, uh, Josh, how do you see it going this evening? Which the, the the Rangers bounce game or the or the uh, yeah, yeah 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 of course <laughs> the, the, I see people asking it's it's not televised but we'll have if you if you stick with us on our on our channels we will have some some coverage of the game so yeah. uh, and that sounds a bit cryptic but it's it's, it's not really where we'll, we'll we'll be live later on at some point with Chris. Water. yeah 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 I watched it uh, it was a good game last night how do I see it going today Ooh, don't know I kind of fancy I think the Netherlands have looked a bit better but England mm. seem to be able to win games late on. I don't know. What do you think? I, yeah. I'm going to say the Netherlands. I, I, I'll actually, I'll be a bit controversial. I'll say yeah, I think, I think it's probably 50-50, pretty much like uh, England-Switzerland the other day there. I think it could go all the way, but I uh, fancy Spain to go on and win it. I think that by yeah. head and shoulders, the best team in that competition. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it later. But let's get back to why people are tuning in, and it's uh, because... Uh, we want to talk about Rangers. There's a few comments I want to flag up. Just uh, going back to the stadium situation, Denzel, what I thought was an interesting point, says, uh, surely the level of money being spent on infrastructure projects will negatively impact the player budget. We should have made sure we had a winning team on the park first. I've heard this from a, a number of supporters, incidentally, that uh, feeling that uh, we should Rangers should have been looking at improving the first team squad rather than uh, out with uh, and, and infrastructure, as Denzel says. So I think it's a it's a casing point. Uh, and if Rangers don't win the league this season, then uh, it'll be brought uh, up, I'm sure, throughout the course uh, of the campaign. The Rangers are failing. Uh, another point that I've seen that got messages yesterday, uh, Joshua, by uh, lots of people about James Tavernier. Uh, you know how people look into pictures at pre-season uh, and ask where players are if they aren't pictured or aren't in the videos. James with the point, Tav seems missing in all the Rangers videos Rangers are releasing. Can we read anything into that? Did see a picture of him on a, an exercise bike. Um, there but, you go. Uh, people are saying he's not involved in the uh, like the, 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 the little games that they play and, and what have you. I, I, I don't, wouldn't read too much into that. If, if he's on the bike, sometimes if he's not involved in, in, the, in the action stuff, he may just be nursing a knock or what have you. I remember when I was in um, Portugal for Rangers pre-season camp, uh, there was a number of players that were on bikes as opposed to uh, contact stuff. John Suter was one. I'm sure there was one or two others uh, that were doing their own, own sort of programmes. I wouldn't read too much into it, Joshua. Uh, would you? I know, we all know there's noise around Tavernier and interest in Saudi Arabia, whether, whether a move materialises or not. Uh, who knows? Um, but I wouldn't read much into not seeing them in training videos. I, I think probably what James is touching upon here, and it's similar to what Chris is saying as well, is people aren't stupid and they can they can read the mood music. Now, clubs can't come out for it. Let, let's say, for example, that Rangers wanted to get rid of, of 10 to 15 players. And we and we know that they do, in an ideal world, want to, to change a large percentage of that squad. They want more leaders. That's a word when you speak to people that continually comes up uh, about, about leadership on the pitch. We know that Todd Campbell is someone who... Uh, that, that, that he's someone who there's there's still value to him as a Rangers player. We know that he can be a really good player on his day, but it, it, it's not he's not a player who, if the right offer came in, Rangers would not listen listen uh, yeah. to that offer. And there's a lot of players in that in that vicinity. There's a lot of players who their, their futures maybe aren't completely um, concrete. 
Tavernier, James Tavernier, he's been here, what, nine seasons? Nine seasons, And in the past, it has always been definitive. No, he will not leave. He's very much front and centre of everything Rangers do. There, yeah, so that cha- and, and where, when that changes, when there's a lot of noises about his future, when there's someone like Dujon Sterling there, who we touched upon this earlier in the week, I, I think that his best position long term, while he's been really effective in the middle of the park, his highest ceiling career-wise could potentially be a right back. And there is a question about, I mean, you can't go into the new season not playing Dujon, Dujon Sterling there. So when all these situations are around a, a player like James Tavenier, and, and again, Rangers, could, you know, they can't come out and say in their pre-season video, look, here's who we want to get rid of. So so they're not going to be in many pre-season videos. I guess you just got to, in, in theory, manage that situation to a degree and, and it depends what offers come in for, for different players. Cyril Dessers is someone who's in a, a, a similar uh, boat. We, we know how much Rangers want for him. We, we've discussed Sam Lammers at length and, and he will presumably or, or is expected to go back to the Netherlands. So that, that is what I would, would say to it. Very similar to the stadium situation. People kind of, they know when there is a, a wider situation at hand. I do think Stuart Campbell's point here the, 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 that the disabled access badly needed addressing is is really important, and that's important to to, to bring up, especially if if you've been someone who's who, who's been impacted by that. I, I guess similar to the new Edmondson House, these projects, when stuff isn't going right on the pitch, are always going to face more scrutiny. Not least when, as is materialised with the stadium situation, you have the really negative impact of the fact that you're not in your stadium at the start of the season. People have paid a lot of money for season tickets. They don't know where they're going next month. All, all the issues that, we, that we've discussed at length, but it is probably important to note that, that the work did need to be done. It's just, as we've discussed, what has happened since has been far from ideal. Yeah, poor. Um, on Tav, uh, I know folks saying that the Saudi market opens on the 17th. I'm sure if he's not part of uh, the Rangers side in the upcoming preseason matches uh, today, of course, uh, the closed doors match, uh, and then Ajax uh, will hear from the manager as to why he's not part uh, of those teams. Um, so, uh, yep, now watch this space with regards to that. Uh, another one, uh, CGM55 says that Adam Devine didn't go to Holland. He was captain of the B team yesterday. Yep, uh, well done to the B team. They uh, thrashed Blackpool by six goals to one at the Rangers training centre. Um, but Devine not part of that pre-season camp. Uh, reading between the lines, Joshua, that yeah. would look like uh, his future is not going to be at Ibrox. We know he spent the second half of the season, last season on loan at Motherwell. Um, if he's not part of uh, uh, the team over in Holland, I can't see him being part of the, the squad this season. Yeah, and again, we'll, we'll find out a little bit today, but also with, with the televised game against Ajax on Saturday, isn't it? Where does Dujon Sterling play? Because if he plays it right back, that's a, that is, that is, I think that could happen. That obviously gives you your two players in that position. So, one to watch there, but yeah, as, as the, the commenter rightly noticed, no, uh, points out, it is noticeable that he is not on this trip because he has obviously been on them in the, in the past when he's when he's been younger. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I think he could be heading for the exit door. Another player that looks to be heading for the exit door is Serio Dessers. Reports in Italy last night, Joshua, that Cagliari uh, and Serie A are keen on uh, bringing him back to Italy and uh, Rangers of course, looking to recoup the four and a half million pounds he paid Cremonese. Uh, whether that uh, prices uh, Calvary out of a move, uh, who knows? But uh, every passing day, there seems to be another club that is keen on Serie Odessa. certainly is a, a man in demand, uh, and that will benefit Rangers uh, because uh, they, I think it will be easy to deal with um, if uh, he's looking to move on. And uh, let's hope a bit of a bidding war opens up with regards to him. I, I think this uh, point we touched on earlier about Niels Coppin, uh, about uh, buying at the right price and selling at the right time. I think this is probably the right time to sell Serial Dessers. Would you agree? Yeah, it is. And, and Rangers want another striker. That would obviously make up a complement of, of three. They only play with one striker, with like Amani and, and, and Danilo. And, and if Dessers is to go, if the Rangers are to get that that fee that they, they initially paid for him, again, to, to reiterate a point you made yesterday, I think it would be good business to get back the money for Lammers and Dessers collectively because of how they started. Dessers is... is Moved a lot in his career, and he's now is he twenty nine or thirty? He's either just turned twenty nine. Yeah, so I mean, his value isn't going to increase. Is he going to score twenty two goals next season? Probably not, because he's probably not going to be a Rangers starting striker. He's on a, a longer deal. Um, 
his his value then decreases. It is clearly the right time to it's the right time to sell him and try and reinvest that into into younger players, as we've seen right throughout the squad. Again, the issue though is is time and Derek. When can you sell him by? How does that impact who you bring in? Uh, if you sell him slightly sooner, do you miss out on some of the revenue from that? He's he got twenty two goals last season, and if you looked at it from the outside looking in, you'd say he got twenty two goals, probably about, about ten a ten assists, maybe something around that ballpark. Scored a couple of big goals, got recalled to the national team. Oh, from the outside looking in, it looks like a brilliant season, and, and there was elements of it that were effective. We know what he's like uh, as a player. He's he's not a player who you watch and, and think. I think always aesthetically that, that that he's the best striker in the world. But I also don't think you can argue in a poor Rangers team that he wasn't relatively effective at points as well. If the money comes in and it is right. If you were to speak to the majority of people watching this, I'm sure they'd say it would be the right time to sell several Dessers because he's not going to play as many minutes. He's not going to score probably as many goals. You want to maximise his value. The question is, when is the right time to sell and, and how does that impact what player you, you tried to get in? Because the whole backdrop of this transfer window is that, as we keep coming back to, you've got those nine games in August. You need to win most of them. And if you don't win most of them, you put yourself in a very difficult uh, situation. And, and, and the squad, you know, speaking on July 10th, is still quite far away from what most people would have envisioned it would be uh, at the end of this transfer window. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I remember when uh, Cholak scored, Cholak scored, what, 20 goals uh, in his season at Rangers. Uh, I did not want him to leave at the time. Dessers have scored, uh, of course, scored a couple more and uh, uh, we're saying, uh, yeah, uh, take the money uh, and move them on. But uh, yeah, I, I would take Antonio Cholak over Serial Dessers. I don't know if you agree, Josh, or if anyone in the comments uh, agrees. Uh, I would, I don't know why, I don't I, I, there's not any high-profile misses, I think, for me with it. Antonio Cholak. Uh, yeah. that's the thing. It's, it's the misses that sort of are uh, highlighted when you when you think of uh, Serial Dessers, even though it is goal record, as you say, is is pretty decent uh, yeah. last season. Um, so uh, let us know, though, I folks. Think of, I think one of Dessers, what what works for him, he's not like you don't look at him and think he's fast, but he is quite a clever player when he presses. Yeah. And I was told that that is something that. It is, you know, when you're when you're looking at uh, what type of players you want to sign, uh, what type of players Rangers want to sign, the, the off-ball work of a striker for Clement style of football and just modern football in general. But that is something that is really, really important. So again, Dessers isn't someone you look at and you think he's lightning quick, but he does a lot of work. And maybe in old firm games, especially I, I, with him and Campbell up top, I don't think that was always the best dynamic when you're trying to, to press a team. But uh, I think that is some, something that's worked for him. But yeah, I mean, if you can get that fee, if you can recoup the money that you shelled out last summer, you can mark that off as, as last summer's business and try and reinvest it in a, just a more sensible manner. Because if you're going to spend that much money on a player at that age within Rangers budget or two players within that age range, when you include Lammers, who's 26, slightly younger, they need to, I think, be pretty transformative to the way that Rangers play. And it, it would be, I think, a sensible way to... Reinvest that money elsewhere, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, just on that, the Cholak miss, uh, potential miss, John says that that mother miss from Cholak was worse than any. Yeah. Derek. Can't recall that that one, but where was that? Ibrox or, or Fur Park? Well, was it? If, I, if, I'm thinking, if I'm thinking of the one that John's talking about, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, it was the 4 2, four two game under Beal. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cholak, yeah, yeah, and yeah. It was when they were kind of playing in split strikers. So Cholak, it, yeah. it in those games, was playing as like a. <laughs> Right winger off the ball, and uh, John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was that one. He, he was a good finisher. Uh, he, he was very yeah. much like a box player, wasn't he? And, and someone yeah. who, but then he didn't get many minutes outside of the start of that season. That, well, as, as Blair says, uh, he scored 18 goals, was getting a goal every 92 minutes. Never should have sold him. Uh, it hasn't quite worked for him at, at Parma. I think it was, uh, somebody uh, said he's only scored three goals uh, last season. But uh, yeah, the CGM says he was a natural finish. He was cold in front of goal, didn't fluff chances. That's the thing I remember uh, of Antonio Trollac. You, you could, more often than not, he would uh, bury opportunities in front of goal. But uh, yep, uh, interesting debate nonetheless. Right, that'll do us there, folks. As we touched on a little earlier on, there's a great piece from uh, David Edgar on the site. Go and check it out. The link is in the description below. Uh, there's also a brilliant interview, as uh, Chris mentioned, 
with Ross McCausland on there uh, and plenty of content to come both on the website and on the YouTube channel over the course of the next few days. Um, so we'll wrap up there. Big thanks to Joshua as ever and thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in to the show. Uh, Joshua and Chris will be back a little bit later on uh, and I will speak to you again tomorrow. Bye for now.